Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, so I would like to welcome the online attendees and the physical attendees again to this uh, first workshop on fundamentals of AI. My name is Junaid Kadir, and I would like to congratulate the organizers for organizing this program and also the attendees for coming on a Saturday to attend this. Uh, I hope to make it worth your time. So my name is uh, Junaid Kadir. Just uh, please give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so my name is Junaid Kadir um, and I'm a professor in the computer science and engineering department. It's not shared, okay. Okay, what I'll do is I will Do you have another one of this? I mean, let me try. It's sharing, no? Yeah, I've, I've shared my slide there and I'm trying to share it. Here. Okay. okay, it's coming. Okay, so hopefully this will work now. I have now shared my screen on Microsoft Teams as well and Hopefully this will work as well. So oh, this is not working. OK, so my name is Junaid Kadir. I'm a professor at the Computer Science and Engineering Department. I have been working in the general area of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for quite some time. And I work. Uh, in applied machine learning and also in its application in networks. And I also study the ethical uh, aspect of AI and the social impact of technology. Uh, so some of my research areas are written below. So you see ethics of AI, safety of AI, robustness of AI, using machine learning and artificial intelligence for social yeah. good. Um, so can you take care of this uh, Muslim? All of the new attendees, uh, yeah. So uh, we have some funded projects in this space as well. So my aim today is to give you a broad introduction to what AI is, what are the types of AI, what is the history of AI. To understand something, we need to also see where it is coming from and what are the intellectual ideas that have contributed to this field. Uh, since AI is a multidisciplinary field, I will talk about the various uh, fields that have contributed ideas to the dominance of AI that we see today. Uh, secondly, I will talk about machine learning. Machine learning is one kind of AI which is very popular these days and much of the modern success of AI is due to machine learning. So I will introduce it and you will have an opportunity to go into this in more depth in a future lecture, which I believe would be, I think, the third session uh, to be delivered by Dr. Abdul Aziz. Uh, so he will go into more depth. My idea today is to tell you what machine learning is and how it fits into the overall 
landscape of AI. Uh, hopefully, we will do uh, a little hands-on exercise as well, which will show you how machine learning differs from more traditional programming techniques. Finally, uh, I will try to finish this with a discussion on the big ideas of AI and the important concerns that relate to AI and machine learning. Since this is a leadership program and to become uh, leaders and thought uh, leaders and um, to do advanced research to become potentially a policymaker in the future, you need to see the big picture of how AI can contribute to human development and what are the risks and potential pitfalls. So this is the plan. Let's start with the first part. I will uh, try to take a break after each part to allow for questions. If you have uh, uh, an urgent question, you can interrupt me. Otherwise, we will have dedicated um, times during the presentation in which questions can be asked. So the first thing is background and history of AI. And uh, the first thing to note is currently, where are we? So we see that now there is a lot of optimism around AI and every country in the world is now thinking about how to incorporate AI into their economy. AI is already, uh, it has transformed many industries. It has enabled many applications and most of us already are active users of machine learning. So if you go uh, to google.com, you, you perform a search or you go to some e-commerce site and you are offered certain recommended products. Or if you go to a newspaper and you are provided uh, news that you may like, all of these things, they are performing seemingly intelligent behavior. And there are there is a lot of research which has fueled this kind of capability. So you see many applications here. Um, so just to make it a little interactive, uh, I know that many of you already have some working knowledge of the field. So can anyone tell me some application that they see and can they describe what that means? For instance, anyone may start with speech processing, OK, OK Google, or you may call Siri to do certain application. Where do you think AI is used there? Yes, voice recognition, which is typically it's difficult for computers to do, but these days computers are able to do it and no one is teaching them explicitly what a sentence is or how various phonemes connect to make up a sentence. And the interesting thing is language has always been known for its ambiguity. It was uh, always considered domain which will be difficult for AI to penetrate into. So now AI is also making strides into speech processing, language generation even, uh, object recognition. If you upload a photo on some site like Google Photos or Facebook, it would recognize people within the photo. It will also, for instance, uh, put a box around the face and it will give you recommendations that this is probably this person. So, it is making our job easy. Uh, if you think of uh, a self-driving car, it is uh, going to be autonomous. It's uh, going to be self-driven. There is um, no driver would be in the loop. Already, uh, many advanced vehicles are already dri dri uh, driven by computers. So even aeroplanes, uh, much of their maneuvering in the air is done by algorithms and it is automated. Now this automation is coming into many parts of our everyday life. Um, AI is used in the financial industry to make algorithmic trading. So all of the decisions that uh, humans have to make, many of them can be automated using AI. And in many cases, those decisions can be better. So this AI, um, we will see what AI means, but the idea is this way of decision making, this can work at a greater scale than human beings could. So human beings uh, have many uh, excellent capabilities, but at the same time, they have certain weaknesses. 
they get tired they can work at a certain rate uh, but they also have a lot of creative capabilities so the idea is that ai is catching up and it is being used in many domains and andrew eng is a prominent machine learning professor uh, and an ai expert he says now that ai is the new electricity just like electricity transformed countless industries ai will now do the same so you see these metaphors being used sometimes people say that data is the new oil just like if you discover oil it can transform the economy of a nation similarly if you can uh, collect data you can make informed decisions ev evidence based decisions you can learn a lot and provide many um, many uh, value added services so some applications are shown here and we see that there is a lot of uh, optimism around ai but let's first of all see and try to define what artificial intelligence is so it turns out that defining intelligence is a philosophical endeavor and therefore different people would define it differently so if there is no consensus on what what intelligence is then obviously even in artificial intelligence the same um, diversity would exist and also we find that uh, ai has a lot of uh, uh, lack of it has a lack of consensus on some fundamental issues so for instance um, if you see these three definitions they are describing ai slightly differently so the first definition is that ai is the study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better so this is a pragmatic definition pragmatic means if you have if you're facing something very complex and something very hard to pin down you make an approximate prediction so from here we see that ai uh, is a moving target something that was referred to as ai in the 1990s maybe your everyday stuff now because you see it every day you use it on your phone you go to a website and you see the same thing so that is no longer ai uh, in a way um, technology is like that sometimes uh, when a thing happens for the first time it looks like magic but then you get used to it and then it is just a part of your life so here the first definition tells us that ai is trying to do things that people are better at and what are those things people are bet better at creativity they are good at language they can speak they can also understand language and language is very complex and language is intricately related to what intelligence is uh, this is what the linguists tell us you might have heard of norm chomsky he is uh, someone who has been working in the general area of cognitive sciences for so long and he and many other cognitive scientists say that language is uh, one of the most important thing that distinguish human beings from other animals and machines and uh, they have a lot to say on this the second definition we see basically is a circular definition ai is the study of intelligent behavior mostly this intelligent behavior is demonstrated by algorithms and machines but you see intelligence is defined in terms of intelligence the third thing is uh, it seeks to explain and emulate intelligent behavior in terms of computational processes so a lot of uh, ai research has tried to use the research on brain and intelligence in an engineering way they want to understand it and create something like it so that they can create and enable some services so in that way ai has been mostly an engineering field but there is also a scientific component people are trying to understand the brain better because to be able to teach a computer you need to understand how you think in the first place okay now um, just like i've mentioned ai 
I would tell you shortly, has been in the works for the last 50, 60 years. Mostly the work started in 1950s and alongside a lot of work has been done in other fields. So AI is mostly in computer sciences, but a lot of research in AI, the, the most seminal ideas, the biggest ideas in AI, they have been published in journals that are related to cognitive sciences. So this is a related discipline and this tries to understand how human beings think. What are the processes, how our vision system works, how our language works. And these are some related sciences, philosophy, psychology, linguistic, artificial intelligence, anthropology, neuroscience. This is a book from a cognitive scientist who tries to understand the, the science of the mind over the last 100 years. It has advanced a lot. Uh, even older philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, they were thinking about what knowledge is and how do we learn about something. Can we only learn by thinking about something or something that we already know or can we learn inductively by doing experiments and looking at the outside world? In the last 100 years, alongside the development of AI, you have advances in this field and these fields have now also started um, becoming sciences. So many of the people who did work in AI, even now you might know some of the leading deep learning experts. Do you know of any names, uh, some leading deep learning researchers? Yeah, if you don't know, it's okay. I will probably talk about it or in some lecture you will see. But the point I want to make is that they are people who have been studying brains. They are either psychologists or cognitive uh, scientists and they're trying to recreate something in a bit to also understand how human beings work and how they think. Elon Musk is uh, the, the founder of Tesla and other companies. He and many other people, they make use of AI. But um, when I talk of researchers, I'm talking about people who are coming up with new ideas. So if you want to have some names of uh, AI researchers, I can give you three Turing Award winners. Turing Award is the highest award we have in computer science. So ACM offers that. So in, I think four or five years ago, three people were given this award. Uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, there's another person who is now, uh, John Nikon, he's the AI head in Facebook. And there's another one, Joshua Bengio, he's in Canada. These are the kinds of people who do active research. So I would say that Elon Musk and other people like him are mostly entrepreneurs. They are making use of AI. They have, everyone now has thoughts about AI, uh, but as such, they are not active research. He's not an active researcher, um, but uh, I hope this clarifies uh, the space. Okay, so AI as a field, it shares a lot with other fields. So AI is related to cognitive science. Cognitive science is the science that studies cognition, how your brain thinks, how your mind works. Uh, robotics is a related field to AI. They also had uh, many common um, developments. A lot of research has fed development in both fields. Philosophy, is obviously related to artificial intelligence because philosophy asks this question, how do we learn? Um, what are the ways through which we can learn? Uh, so, and these two fields are basically mathematical fields. Statistics makes use of maths to make sense of data and operations research is a mathematical field through which we can make good plans. So with AI and machine learning, you can do now these things as well. You make use of statistics to learn from data. Statistics is actually the underlying science behind machine learning. Machine learning has now become the cool name for what people have been doing in statistics. The difference is that now you have lots of data, so you need more advanced statistics. 
But the idea is that you cannot understand AI in isolation. So uh, although you will get um, high level overview to what AI is, to be able to master this field, you need to spend a lot of time. You need to see how this field connects to other fields and have a curious mind that you used to learn for a long time and then you will start to understand things. So now if I ask you what intelligence is, this is a very important question for understanding AI. Even now, I think we can agree on different things that together contribute to intelligence. Even in terms of human intelligence, there are many kinds of intelligences. Howard Gardner, the person I showed you the book of earlier, he is famous for this research on multiple intelligences. He says that uh, there are various aspects of intelligence and maths and the ability to solve puzzles and logical questions. It's just one kind of uh, intelligence. You also have, for instance, interpersonal intelligence. Someone who might be very good in maths may not be good in communicating with people and understanding their own emotions. This is obviously also important. If a person is not able to understand his or her emotion or they are not able to talk to other we will not call th uh, those people intelligent so we see that interaction with people also becomes important if we have a computer that only does maths but is not able to see how that decision will affect people we cannot say that it is intelligent and then there is according to gardner this linguistic verbal intelligence because uh, human beings, in in philosophy, we used to say that it is al uh, haywan natik, the speaking animal. In contrast to other animals, which used to grow, but the distinguishing feature between other animals and human beings is that they have language. So the person who has better language skills is more intelligent. And then there is visual, spatial intelligence, logical, mathematical. We stress this too much these days, but there are other kinds of intelligences. And similarly, in AI as well, you will find the techniques for different kinds of tasks, they come under the umbrella of AI. For instance, all of the mathematical techniques that allow you to solve problems you can call them that they are AI. AI essentially is using computers to demonstrate intelligent behavior. Another name for this can be computational intelligence. The agent who is doing the intelligent action is the computer. So the first definition is problem solving. You're given a problem with certain constraints, certain objective, and you try to solve that. This is problem solving. Can you think of some other definition of intelligence? Other than problem solving. Communication is uh, an important problem, uh, important part of intelligence. And optimization is another. Optimization means you can do something in various ways, but trying to do something in the best possible manner. This is known as optimization. So one aspect of AI is to optimize over things. The algorithms that optimize are known as intelligent. Also, the ability to learn from experience is important for someone to be called intelligent. If you know how to solve problems, that's OK. But if you are not expanding on your tool set, then you are not really intelligent in a way. This is one another way of looking at it. So there are therefore AI techniques that allow you to learn from experience. Just like the philosophers, they said that you could use logic and you could use the scientific empirical method. Logic allows you to reason about things you already know, but with science you can observe things and generalize from that. So this is important for intelligent behavior. And therefore, later on, you will see within AI, you have different tribes. They have their own methods. They are doing something intelligent, but 
they have their own methods and you have some other methods and you have some other methods. All of them are broadly speaking AI. You also have this ability to reason about things using logic. So this is um, important when you want to reason. Uh, you, you agree on something and you try to find what is also true if this is true. This is how logic works. You start with certain axioms. Maths also works in this way. And then you try to produce more theorems, more, uh, more theories, uh, more lemmas, all of those things you do in maths. The ability to recognize patterns. Again, human beings are intelligent and they can, for instance, recognize danger very soon. If they are in some isolated place and if they can quickly sense if they're under danger and how have they acquired this skill, it is basically through recognizing patterns. So intelligence, therefore, is also about this ability. The ability to figure out causes of things, even though much of modern AI just focuses on correlations. Uh, I think uh, you might have studied statistics. Uh, how many of you have studied statistics? And you would have heard this term, correlation is not causation, which means just because two things occur together does not mean one has caused the other. So just like uh, uh, an example of this would be that the ability to read well is related to your shoe size. There is a correlation. But does having large feet make you think or read better? No. What is the underlying cause? What do you think is the underlying cause here? Yeah, as you grow old, your feet size increases and also you can read better. You are now correlating two things which are not related actually. So in data science, you have lots of data, but you cannot do experiments. Usually the scientific method required you to do something and also not do something and compare. Then you would know what doing something leads to. And in this way, you could figure out the causes of things. Modern machine learning is deficient in this way that you are only seeing patterns. And sometimes this leads to sloppy signs. But in any case, uh, intelligent behavior means having this ability to figure out the causes of things and the ability to pursue objectives and purpose. So you see there are so many definitions and therefore techniques that try to do these, they come under the umbrella of AI and therefore you will see when you work in this area for a long time, you see that there are many things that come under AI, they are very different. They pursue a very different um, definition of what AI is, but still they are under this larger umbrella. Also the ability to generalize and abstract and make analogies. For instance, uh, if you take a course on maths and they teach you, for instance, a uh, method, the Pythagoras theorem, they give you two or three examples. And on the test, would you be asked the same question or some other question? It should be a different one because your ability to generalize is sought. Not just the examples that you were taught are not everything. So this ability to generalize means you have learned something, but can you apply in new settings? Can you identify similar patterns in the future? So this ability is also part of intelligence. So uh, if you see this book, this is uh, the standard book on AI, the classical textbook. Uh, it's by Peter Norwich and St Stuart uh, Russell. Uh, he defines intelligent agent as a system that perceives the environment and takes action which maximizes its chance of success. This is one other definition, but you see it's focused on one notion of intelligence, which is problem solving, reward optimization, and so on. Uh, this is like um, if you have studied robots, you also see they are doing something similar. They have sensors, they have actuators, they have a brain, 
they have some function that they are trying to optimize. So AI and robotics, they're also related in various ways. So now um, let's see some history of AI to see why was the word AI used for this kind of work. So it started in 1956. Before 1956, uh, there were other fields of knowledge which tried to do something similar. So these two and some other scientists, this is John McCarthy and he is Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon is very famous in electrical engineering because he invented an entire field uh, called information theory, which is the mathematical study of how in information works and it is underlying the modern IT revolution. So he, uh, a lot of his work is still used now. He defined the field and people are now filling in the gaps. And John McCarthy, uh, he was at Stanford, MIT, and they organized this uh, workshop in 1956. And at that time, they were thinking that getting a computer to demonstrate intelligent behavior would be easy. So they said, we will gather around 15 to 20 people Different scientists will talk together, we'll agree on the vocabulary of AI, we'll agree on the methods, and we will solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans so that these machines can improve themselves. We think that a significant advance can be made if we work on it together for a summer. So at that time, uh, the scientists were very optimistic that we now have computers and uh, we can um, get the machines to do amazing things in just a few years. So at that time in 1950s and 60s, these are some of the other people who also attended the same workshop. These are sometimes called the fathers of AI because they coined the term AI. And they used AI because at that time there was another science that was very dominant, but it was pursued by another researcher. His name was Norbert Wiener. He was trying to study how organisms and machines, they are similar in how they're trying to optimize and how they make use of feedback to pursue purposes. So these people, they did not get along with him very well. So they said, we will not use the term cybernetics. We will use a new term so that we get funding for this project. And therefore, they came up with this term, artificial intelligence. People now say that it might have been better to call it uh, computational intelligence or some other term, but this is how it the name came out to be. So you see the founding fathers, they were very optimistic. They were saying, this is Herbert Simon. He was mainly in cognitive science, but also psychology and computer science. At that time, these fields, uh, a person could work in all of these fields together. So he was saying that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. Um, Marvin Minsky, another person who is um, also, who, who, who took part in this uh, workshop, he said that within 10 years, the problems of AI will be substantially solved. And Claude Shannon also said something similar. Uh, at that time, the approach people took was to encode knowledge explicitly. So uh, you would, you wanted the computer to do intelligent behavior, but experts were in charge of telling the computer what to do. For instance, if you want it to solve some problem, you would give it an algorithm. If you wanted to recognize something, you will tell the computer, this is the way you should recognize it. If you wanted to uh, act like a doctor and give some diagnosis, you would tell it that look for these rules and at the end you can give a diagnosis. But uh, this system was difficult. Can you guess why? Why is this? Um, 
why is this system difficult to implement and why even though we can have some successes at some point you will hit a wall what do you think is the reason yes because to describe everything that happens in the world is very complex because you have certain rules but there are always exceptions to the rules and if you try to capture everything it becomes very complex and also another thing is that there is a limit to what you can predict and um, while we think that we can understand everything about the world the world is much more unpredictable than what we think and therefore this project of articulating things and telling the computer it exposed to the scientist how little they know of how they think themselves so for instance if i ask you like i would ask you uh, we will do an exercise how do we distinguish between the digits 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 you all know how to do it but if i ask you to give me a rule whatever rule you will give me you will find that there are exceptions to it and it is a very cumbersome task trying to describe how you make decisions so at this time around 1988 uh, this industry which was knowledge based approaches uh, one method was expert systems you would go to experts and ask okay you are a doctor you are a radio radiologist how do you make decisions what are the things you look for and they try to encode that but because the world outside is uncertain another important aspect is things are probabilistic many a times you do something and you cannot guarantee it will help you succeed you can only describe in terms of probability in terms of risks of uh, failure and six, uh, the chances of success so in this case you you want to use the use of probability at this stage the use of probability was very less this is like the older times when the people only made use of logic to learn about things the scientific method was based on statistics you would observe something uh, but what you observed was not always the case you you could still find a pattern but the relationship was statistical rather than math logical or mathematical so this system failed because the real world is uncertain and to to reason about physical things we need to make use of probability which these uh, techniques were not using at the at that time and also they did not have the benefit that we have now of lots of data so if you have lots of data you can use the scientific method and you can use statistics to learn uh relationships in a probabilistic way and that changes the game so because of the lack of success of uh, the expert systems ai it faced a tough time in the 1990s uh, this time is called ai winter in which unlike the earlier times where people were very excited the hype was uh um in a way uh, the hype caught up with the reality and uh, the funding agencies they stopped funding ai and uh, one example is for instance uh, even though you you had some successes with expert systems but the translation that you could do at that time was quite bad because uh, you were doing mostly word to word substitution the use of synonyms and so on uh, but if you were to translate this sentence into russian and translate it back all of the real i mean this is a poetic sentence although the words here are the same spirit is like vodka in one way they are synonyms flesh is like meat in one way but it's totally out of context and uh, 
the modern machine learning based language translation uh, thing works better because you have a large corpus of data. You have gigabytes of data and through that you can find statistical patterns and also see how language is generally used. We also learn how language is used because we observe people and we see whatever is used. Mostly we use the same idioms. So modern machine learning is better than this because it's not rule based. It is data based. You see lots of data and you try to pick up patterns from that. So the complexity of the world made it very hard to encode all rules and it precluded approaches such as expert based systems. Since the problem space grew too quickly, if you, if you wanted to solve a problem in the real world, considering all possibilities became very difficult and the techniques the computing power we had at that time, the data that we had was not sufficient for the task. In the time 1990 to 2012, roughly, statistical approaches and probabilistic approaches, they came to the fore. Uh, you used methods which allow you to reason about causes seen the uh, symptoms you see the data and you want to know the patterns you you had certain techniques that allowed you to do that and this enabled a new ai spring starting in 2012 something amazing happened at that time um, a successful demonstration of deep learning was shown which is a technique that makes use of lots of data with a very large computer, a big server, computational capabilities. With that, a new approach came to the flow, which is called the data-driven approach. What was the approach before this? I call it the knowledge-based approach. This is the data-driven approach. You are using the data to learn the patterns. And this is behind the success of modern AI. So uh, these words, these terms are related. Sometimes you hear of data science, you hear of big data, machine learning. They are basically the way modern AI is working so well. So uh, with these three things, the, uh, the presence of big data, having lots of computational power and efficient algorithms have allowed us to learn from experience, model uncertainty in a more effective way allowing various successes such as you know this car stanley it may made use of uh, ai methods uh, probabilistic methods through which it could drive autonomously across a desert of more than 100 kilometers uh, ibm watson was able to defeat the um, the computer in the game jeopardy uh, it was asked natural language questions and it could respond and uh, computers were able to outplay human beings on many games. So I think the, um, at this stage we have come to the end of part one. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, if you require any clarification or if you want a short break, this is the time. Okay, can you ask me the question? Yeah. Somebody's asking, can we consider AI as a sort of computationally driven statistical inference? Yes, so uh, that is one aspect of it. But like I've mentioned, AI is many things. To different people, it is different things. Uh, at one point in my presentation, I will show you a slide about the various tribes in AI. But uh, your way of describing is it is uh, valid as well. In fact, it is the most dominant way of doing AI. Computational way of using statistics uh, based on data. Yes.
Okay, so if anyone has a question, they can use their mic to ask the question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so my question is like, um, we, we talk about like the AI and the machine learning. So can you comment on the computational co uh, complexity that um, how much the computational complexity is um, acceptable or how the scientists uh, see the computational complexity of the AI or the machine learning algorithm? Okay, thank you very much. So that's an excellent question. Um, and the question for uh, all of the audience here is that uh, with intelligence, we are trying to demonstrate intelligent behavior, but is there any cost to it? Like for instance, if you go to the market, then sometimes various um, products are available. Sometimes for something you have to pay more. Um, sometimes you like something very much, but the cost is too high. In a similar manner, uh, some of these approaches, they have trade-offs. Um, if you want to use a data-driven approach, you need to have lots of data. You need to have a large computer. And uh, so there is more of a computational cost. Statistics in particular, if you use Bayesian methods and you use lots of data, it is uh, the, it is the main reason up till 2012 this was not possible because the the methods were available but the computers were not so advanced so now you can learn very large models but you must remember that you have to uh, have appropriately sized computers and there is an energy cost as well so in these days there's uh, some controversy whether the use of modern, very large models, are they sustainable or not? Because these companies, they are going for more and more bigger and bigger models, and it, that requires you to use um, a lot of energy. Uh, so that's a question open to debate, and people are now saying that uh, we should have sustainable methods. Uh, we should ensure that our uh, computation is not too much. So to answer your question again, yes, there is um, a trade-off. And uh, since there are various methods available, um, it's not possible to um, comprehensively compare all of them. But some methods are just rule-based methods. Some of them, uh, they can operate uh, very quickly. Some of them, so there are engineering trade-offs in terms of time taken, energy consumed. And another thing I would like to just point out here, that now there is also this trend of purposefully making use of smaller models. Because with that, you can run it on very small devices. And uh, those small devices will not require a lot of uh, energy. So in summary, it depends on your task and your uh, the place you would be running your model and accordingly you can make an engineering choice any other questions there is something called quantum uh, computing yes it has been like for, for maybe a decade it's now like emerging yes so it, does it have something to do with the growth of ai in the past few years um, they are saying that it's a very advanced level of computing which does not rely on binary, which is slower, yes. very, very much slower than the quantum, yes. some kind of thing. Yes. So quantum computing, uh, I'm not an expert on it, but what I know is that it makes use of quantum physics and advances in, it's not directly using AI as such, but if we have this quantum computing capability, we can do much more powerful computing and much more powerful AI. So the science that is feeding into that is mostly coming from quantum physics. And those are the people working in this and people from computer architecture and places like that. Yes, yeah, so you want to take a break, five minute break? Yes. Yeah, so 
Uh, what's the second question? <laughs> Large data for the model. Is it uh, the more the better? Because if we compare it to traditional research field, it isn't always preferable to have inappropriately large sample sizes. Yes. So these are very nice questions. These are philosophical questions, and it depends on what angle you take. Uh, so the second point about, I think it's mostly the same question about trade offs. Is it, if I understand correctly, it's about trade-offs and the answer there is that um, uh, it depends on what philosophy you take even because this is then a question of uh, economics as well can we have indefinite growth in a limited and uh, in a in a planet that has limited resources so the idea is that we need to have sustainable technology we should not be uh, just focusing on one thing, which is the accuracy. We should also be seeing how, what cost we have to pay, and is it worth the uh, the effort for you know just getting a little more accuracy, spending a lot more resources. So it, within computing, there is a trend called approximate computing, in which people are intentionally making your accuracy a little less to get other benefits. So, uh, and there's a lot of uh, focus now also on low energy sustainable computing. So it depends, uh, there is no single answer, but in general, yes, uh, uh, we should be very careful about the engineering trade-offs you make. The second question, um, uh, you can read uh, the many more intelligent people than me have commented on that, whether uh, AI will take over humans and there are uh, like we say we have ikhtilaf in that um, some people are of the view like Elon Musk he, he was saying and many other people that we, this is an existential risk and they say you are going to the end of the cliff with a, at a very high speed and uh, don't be surprised that you will fall off when you get there so some people uh, very reasonable people are saying this. Some other people are saying that what we are doing is narrow AI and it's not general AI. So it does not pose a risk to us, even if it does better than us in some tasks, it is, uh, uh, we have broader skills, we have uh, general intelligence. So people disagree on this question. Yes. Yes, I will inshallah come to that in the next part. Uh, the next part is machine learning and uh, hopefully at the end we will have that discussion. Okay, so we take a five minute break inshallah.
Okay, let's start again. Okay, so up till now we have been talking about AI, but like I've mentioned that AI has within it many things. So the thing that is currently most famous and most prominent in AI is called machine learning. And machine learning itself is based on using big data and learning patterns from data and training a model which can then make a prediction. So you might have also have heard of uh, the terminologies, neural networks and deep neural networks. They are further uh, divisions of machine learning. They are particular kinds of machine learning. So we have seen previously that if you want to teach concepts to computer in the traditional way, it's, it's very hard. And the reason is, the world is very complex. The world is also uncertain. And it's difficult to describe everything that will happen in the future. Uh, there is no rule. We see certain trends and patterns, but those are just patterns. They are those associations that we see in the physical world. They are statistical in nature. And I think you asked this question about quantum uh, physics. Quantum physics also tells us that the things that we observe in the real world, they, the associations are statistical. So the, which basically means you cannot predict with certainty what will happen. There is a limit to prediction and therefore we make use of probability and statistics. So the difference between the previous approach and the new approach is that now we are making use of uh, probability uh, and we are learning from data. So this is uh, one of the pioneers of machine learning. His name is Arthur Samuel. He was the person who coined this term machine learning. He uh, wrote a paper in 1962 in which he basically said that even though we are trying to program a computer to do something very simple, it is not very complex but we need to spell out every minute step of the process in the most exasperating detail. Computers, as any program will tell you, are giant morons, not giant brains. The thing is, the, the bottleneck of the previous approach was that you had to specify everything in exasperating detail, which means there are so many counter cases and exceptions, you have to describe everything. And that meant if you wanted to encode something which is complex, you have to spend a lot of time on that. You could not simply ask your learning algorithm to learn all of the patterns there are in the data. You had to tell it yourself. So what he suggested therefore was that you should give the computer the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So the idea then was that instead of passing input to your program to produce the output. You teach the computer, you run a learning algorithm here and you give it examples. You say, okay, this is a cat, this is another cat. Have a look at these 10,000 images of cats and through that learn the concept of a cat so that I can use this model to make future predictions. So when I show it an image, that model should be able to tell me if this is a cat or not. And in this way, whatever the concepts are there in the input output, basically this learning algorithm learns a model that when it sees an output, it can make a prediction of what the right output is. So the essence of machine learning uh, is written here. This is uh, material coming from this nice book, Learning from Data. Uh, the author of this book, he also has an online course, um, Yasir Abu Mustafa from Caltech. He basically, uh, there are in fact three authors here. They say that the essence of machine learning is that although you do not know 
how to recognize something. You do not know everything, but you have data uh, and the data itself has some pattern. Things are not just random. There is some underlying reason. And for instance, if you were to see it yourself, you would be able to say what is what, even though you cannot tell the computer how I came to that decision. So if you have that data, you make the algorithm learn it. So let the computer learn a model for the concept itself using these learning algorithms. And the model at the end basically is sort of a black box. At the end, once this model has been learned, you can give it the input. It will give you the right output, hopefully, if the training is done well. So the question then still remains that, OK, we have changed one thing for the other. Earlier, we were required to express the program. Now the question is, how do we learn the right weights or model parameters? Because you see that the learning algorithm, it has to learn the mathematical function that is used to convert the input to the output. So for that, how do we learn the right weights? The answer to this is that this is your model. This is what you're learning. It has weights that can be adjusted. And using this, you feed the input here, it produces an output. And since you have a labeled data set, you know what the real answer is. For instance, you provide it a cat image. It tells you that this is a cat and this is actually a cat. So you don't have an error. So the training of the model requires you to give um, lots of data to the learning algorithm and you check how good it is. If it's not good, you tweak the things. You tweak the parameters until you have better and better predictions. And the good thing now is that there are automated algorithms which allow you to optimize this. Now, once this is optimized, there would be very little difference between what you are predicting and what are the actual labels. And that is where you can stop and use this model then for prediction. Uh, this thing, the difference between what you are predicting and what is the actual label is known as the loss. And if you plot it up using you know, concepts that you learn in multivariate calculus, this would be a function like this. This would be like a curvy mountain. What you want to do is you want to find the lowest point because you want to minimize the loss. This is the loss function. The loss function at some combinations of the parameters is very high. And the loss function for some combination of the parameters is very low. We want to choose the parameters that minimize the loss. This is basically the learning that machine learning does. The model is fixed, but the parameters are learned. The parameters are what transform the input to the output. So this is uh, the same thing in action. This is your model. These are the weights that you are learning. So what is happening is that you start with some, some random assignment. You make a guess, you compare it to the actual label. If the performance is very bad, you update the weights. You update the weight in a way that reduces the loss. And you'll keep on doing it until your loss gets to a very low value. Basically, what you're doing is you're starting from some random point. It's very easy to understand. Imagine that you are in this mountainous area. You started, you started here. And you want to go to the lowest point. What you should do? You should just look around you. And whichever place is low, just go there. So even though it's not guaranteed that you will come to the lowest point in this entire range, even if you come here, this is good enough. So in machine learning, even though we don't have the actual optimal, it is mostly good enough. So we come here and then we choose that model for making predictions. 
So now another thing to remember is that with machine learning, even though we can make good predictions, we don't necessarily understand how these predictions are being made. Because of this, this model is sometimes called a, a black box. It gives you the answer, but we don't know why and how it arrived at the answer, except that based on what we have seen previously, this seems to be a good guess. Okay, now let's try to do a hands-on activity. So do you know this character? Yeah, I, I think uh, he is common within the Arab world. So Juha is uh, um, an intelligent donkey and we wanted to teach, is it intelligent or not? In any case, it's a mythical character we use in this world. So <laughs> we will try to teach it to recognize Digits, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How can we teach it? Yeah, so you already are influenced by machine learning. So that's good. Otherwise, if we were to tell it that a one is like this, it's a vertical line, it becomes very difficult because if you have a picture, your one could be on one side or the other side. It could be slanted. It could be slanted this way or the other way. You may have this, or you may not have this. This could be in any direction, and this could be long or small. But the idea is that we are able to recognize all of that as one. But if we have to specify and tell Juha that one is this, it becomes, imagine if you have to do it in a way that catches all of the ones and all of the twos, all of the possible ones and twos people can come, Actually, you would have an almost infinite variations of one. And if you think of other objects, real world objects, again, you have lots of diversity. So a better way is that we learn and we make it learn through machine learning. We give it many examples and we ask it to just generalize from what we have shown. Just like if you want to teach a kid if you want to teach your younger brother, sister, child that this is a cat, how many examples do you think you have to show it? One, two, three, because the kid is more intelligent than Juha. But Juha is like machine learning models. They, they use a lot of examples. So if you want to get good accuracy, you need to show it maybe hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of examples of that class. But we will, in the interest of time, show it some examples. So for this, we will make use of this tool, machine learning for kids. Uh, machine learning is so simple, it can be taught to kids. So we'll make use of this uh, tool and, use, and we will use the Scratch language. There are other languages as well. Um, Scratch is basically very easy, so we will try to do this. So let me share my screen and sorry i'm sorry i'm unable to hear you scratch is a general programming language it's a programming language that has been created to teach coding to small children yeah it's not for robotics it's for it's for robotics and much more in fact, I will show you how to use it for machine learning. OK, so we go here. You see, this is machine learning for kids. I go to the project. I've already started it because uh, in the interest of time, we could do it all here. But what I'm doing is I'm telling Juha that we have 10 classes and the 10 classes look something like this. So you do you recognize all of these as ones? They are all different. If you were to match them in terms of pixels, none of them are the same, but they are all one. So instead of telling Juha that you look for a vertical line and possibly you might have these uh, lines as well. You just show it examples and in the hope that it will learn itself. Th these are all twos. 
these are all threes. You see, this is slightly odd, but it still would be recognized by as a three by people. This is very small, but still a four. I have made five, uh, I'm sorry, I've made 10 examples of all. This is six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. So let me add one more example to everyone. So I will go to draw a new example. I will add one more example so that we create a new model. I think we can do it again. Sorry. This is going to be a single model, but it is making a classification between all of these digits. So you give it your image, it will tell you if it's a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's a single model. It can be different. In real life, your uh, data, even though you would like it to be balanced, but in many times you have much more data of one class. So whatever you have, you try your best to make it balanced but you can make it different. So just to show, let me make two sixes here. OK, so I have added all of these. Let's now. Oh, so it says project already has maximum number of training data. So it seems that they have some limitation on how many data that we have. So what we have currently, I'll show that to you. All of these. Let's go back. I think maximum 10 can be added because this has to be run within the browser. Most machine learning models, they're actually run on servers. But let's train this now. I'm giving it examples. I'm telling you all of these are one, all of these are two, and so on. Let's now train this model. So we have collected all of these examples. And now the model is developed. It says that model started training on Friday. And it's currently available. And if I want to test it. Uh, I can probably this is of the model I trained yesterday, but I can do it again as well. It will be the same. Let me try it again because the data is still the same. So it trains it. It is trained on Saturday, January 15th, 10.32 a.m. Now I can test it. So I put something here. It recognizes it as two, which means our data is not as good, but let's try other things. Four. Recognized as four with 87% confidence. So in reality, the machine learning model requires lots of data. We just gave it 10 examples of badly drawn images. But still, it is able to successfully see it. Let's see. Can it recognize this? No, gives an error. Nine. 
recognize there's nine. If the thing is, uh, the model is trying to pick up features which make nine a nine. So if we represent that in our image, it is able to successfully figure that out. Let's draw something else. Recognize there's one with 91% confidence. So if we want to improve this, what do you think we, we should do? Have more representative data and all of its variations. So there is a famous database of, of digits called MNIST. It's the it's probably the most famous data in machine learning yeah, from the older times. You have many examples of zeros, ones, and all of the digits. And if you train the machine learning algorithm well, it will have about 99% accuracy. It will be able to detect all of the digits correctly. Now, the good thing is we have this model. We can take it to Scratch or to Python or other places. Uh, and we can use it there. So if I open this, this is the Scratch language. So let me bring Joha here. I can add sprites. Mm. I can take him out, reduce the size. So the good thing is that you have all of these libraries. I just created a model called numbers. And if I click here, I have this ability to recognize these numbers. Also, if you go to other models, machine learning for kids, they also have other libraries that you can use. For instance, within Scratch, you can go to Twitter and search for something. You could do speech to text. You write something, uh, you say something, and it is able to recognize. It's very impressive. You're talking to your computer, and it is able to recognize it. It is now very commonplace because even your phone can do it, but it is still amazing because you're, it's being done by the computer. So all of these libraries are here. Let's try to program this. So we add this place where we will be adding the number. The point of all of this is that once you have created a model, you can take it and use it somewhere else, and it will do the job of recognizing the, the digits. So for the code of this, let's say that we start we say that when this flag is clicked, you set the variable. Let, let's call it number because we are recognizing a number. Uh, set, set number to what you are recognizing it. So for that, we are going to make use of this machine learning library, the model that we have just downloaded. And so once we do this, now whatever the costume image where I'm going to draw the character, whatever that is recognized, it is put into this variable number. Let me now then also make an announcement. Say that number detected. So this um, part of the coding is done. Now let's come here where we are going to make Juha say something. So you say, Say you start with when I receive say, and since you want to say two things, let's join those. Um, do you guys have experience with Scratch? Okay, so we want to say, I think the number you wrote is.
So let's go now and write something. So it's not going to be perfect because we gave it just 10 examples. Let's write seven. We run it again. Yeah, so let's try something else. So number detected. Let's try some other number in the hope that it will work. Yeah, it's not perfect. Actually, um, did I download the model? OK, so here's another one that I created. And so let's give it some other example. OK, so. So it's working like some of the times, but the point is that if you have a advanced machine learning algorithm, it can make predictions. Uh, Johar needs more examples than 10. And in most, this is a problem we have with deep learning. And one difference we have with human learning, the people who are now working on AI, they want to make advanced AI so that we can learn from very little examples, just like human beings do. But with deep learning, you need to give it hundreds and thousands of examples because there are various variations of all of these digits. So, but I hope with this, you have seen the impressive power of machine learning and how you can use it as an API. And basically, just like you did machine learning here, there are various ways of using machine learning. One of it is to actually develop a model, come up with new techniques. Another is just to be a user. Just use it as an API. Just use the services for whatever purpose you have. OK, so let's come back now to our presentation. OK, so let me start again. So by now, I hope you, you know what machine learning is. Machine learning requires there is. But if you have enough data and if you generalize well, you your model will work for new examples. OK, so we have come a long way. We have discussed AI, history of AI. We came to the AI spring, machine learning. We have now seen an example of machine learning in action. OK, let's move ahead and talk of various kinds of machine learning. So I'm just going to tell you some terms which you might hear uh, in the field or you might see them in some research paper that you read. There are a few 
kinds of machine learning. In supervised learning, the kind I showed you just now, you show it examples and also you, you give it the answer. You say this is a cat, you give it 200 images of a cat. This is a dog, 200 images. Some other animal, 200 images. In fact, many more images. Uh, so here the image itself is called X, the first object and the correct label is given the second object and the correct label is given and through that you are asking it to make a prediction what we have just done now is a multi-class classification in a multi-class classification you give an image to the classifier it will give you an answer the answer can be 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 which are the classes we have here Sometimes you only have a binary class classification, uh, either success or failure, either yes or no. So in those classifiers, for example, you want to see if something is a fraud or not, if something is a toxic comment or not. You have many such classes in which you just have two classes. So that's known as a binary class classification. What we saw just now is a multi-class classification. So uh, you might have heard the term deep learning. Deep learning is different from neural networks. Neural networks is a technique that people invented to loosely imitate how human beings, how their brain works. We have certain input and then that is processed through certain neurons and there are interconnections of neurons. Uh, and the idea in neural networks is that sometimes for some input, certain neurons would be activated. And uh, with appropriate activation, uh, the right output layer neuron would be activated and you would be able to know what kind of an object it is. In the older neural networks, you only had a single layer. So you could not learn a lot of features. So uh, Please try to understand this, that when we are trying to recognize objects, we are looking for certain things in that thing. For instance, if it's a cat, the cat would have cat ears and it would have a tail maybe, but a tail is also had by other animals. So you look for features which will allow you to discriminate between the objects. Here you just have one layer, but with a deep neural network, you could have multiple layers. So what is actually happening is that here you look for very coarse grain features. For example, where the edges are. Okay, so in a face, uh, if you have an algorithm which is trying to detect if a certain image has a face or not. Google photo has this. Every time you upload a photo, it would detect faces and it would tell you, is this this person? Is this this person? But for that, first of all, it has to detect a face. Now, a face is uh, easily detectable because it differs from the um, pixels. If this was uh, an image, the face differs from the edges and areas. So you have these edges which indicate that a new thing is starting. So if you use just these features, you'd be able to know that this is an edge. But then if you combine the edges in particular ways, you would be able to form various parts. For example, here you see something that looks like an eye, something that looks like a nose. And then you can combine these things to still form you know, higher level features. And in this way, if you combine these smaller features, you can look for larger features. In this way, by appropriate tuning of these weights. Remember when I showed you machine learning training, I said you make a prediction, you compare it to the actual label, and then you try to fix the weights so that the next prediction is better. And you keep on doing it until this thing performs very well on your data. And you hope that it will also perform well on new data. And the, the way it is operating is it is looking for features. Here it's looking for uh, these edges. And when you go ahead, you look for you know, features that combine multiple features. 
Okay, for instance, if I have to recognize a face, a face is something in which we have eyes and nose and lips and ears. But to be able to recognize, first of all, we need to recognize eyes and we need to recognize nose and ears and all of those things. So this thing can only be done when the first initial things can be done. So a neural network allows us to learn hierarchical representations. These are known as representations or features through which we can understand the data. This is a higher level representation. This is a higher level still uh, of a representation of the input. So deep neural networks allow us to learn these representations and this is how modern AI works. These are some other ways in which ML predictions can be made. We have up till now just seen supervised learning, but you can also do sequence to sequence translation or classification. You are given a sentence, which may be very long. When it is translated into Arabic, it might not be as long. It may have different number of words. And similarly, you can combine or transform from one language to another. In dialogue, you may give it some uh, history and it would predict what should be said next. Uh, have you ever experienced something like this on your email? If you are writing an email on Gmail, it will suggest you just write a few words. It will suggest autocomplete. Use this. And it is doing that by seeing that how people usually write. And to make your job easy, it is suggesting you what you should say. OK, this is another example in which you give it an image and it would segment it. This is useful because it allows you to see the different parts that we have in this image. This is uh, another application in which you give it the learning algorithm, many images and many captions. And then the hope is when you give it a new image, it will be able to give you a sentence that describes the image. This is again something that we ask, uh, ascribe to human intelligence that you would be able to find out and describe what is there in the image. You can do this algorithmically by training your machine learning model on lots of images that have captions, and then you can make a prediction on a new image. Apart from supervised learning, we have unsupervised learning, and uh, I think you would be able to guess the difference. Can you guess the difference between supervised and unsupervised? In supervised, we are doing supervision in what way? We are providing the labels or the answers. Yes, here we are not giving that supervision. We are just giving it the data and we are saying, use whatever maths you can use to understand and organize this data better. Right? So here we don't give any answers, but still we can do something useful using mathematical algorithms to organize or cluster the data, or maybe recognize that this thing is normal and this thing is malicious or anomalous. Yes, so another way we can differentiate machine learning models is to differentiate between two kinds of intelligence. For instance, uh, there are two words noted here. One is generative and another is discriminative. For instance, you're doing a project. You go to a supervisor. You show the project to the supervisor. The supervisor says it's not good enough. It is feedback, but it is discriminative, not in that discriminatory sense. It means uh, the supervisor is distinguishing between good work and bad work. Or discriminatory, mod a discriminative model would be, you give it two images, it tells you it's a cat or a dog. You are making discrimination. Another kind of a model is, discrimination means doing what we call FARC. You know FARC? Yeah. Distinguishing two things. Another way is generative, which is a model in which you learn a probability distribution through which you can generate new samples. So if you give various inputs, 
to this model and if this generated model is a way for creating cat faces for a different input it would give you a different cat face so this is a different kind of a model in this way the supervisor is telling you exactly what to do and you just follow that and you're done so you see there are two different ways of operation discriminative and generative with discriminative you your job is just to discriminate between different classes here your job is to actually create something so the interesting thing now is that ai what do you think does it have support for generative models yes and that's the impressive part uh, i'll show you uh, that there are these methods uh, this is a very interesting technique it's called a generative adversarial network adversarial means there are two people who are competing with each other so we have two neural networks one of them is a generator it is creating images and we have a discriminator which is saying it's good enough or not so both of them are in competition it wants to create realistic looking images and this wants to accurately detect if it's a real or a fake if you allow these neural networks to compete over time you're able to create very realistic images it becomes a generative model because this generator is coming up with new and new versions of that object an example of this is this site uh, this person does not exist this is a photo imagined by a computer because the computer was trained on many images if you go to this website this person does not exist it makes use of a gan a generative adversarial network called style gan which has been trained on many faces and now you give it certain parameters it will give you a new face uh, nvidia has a tool like this uh, you give it a photo of someone and you ask it grow its hair make the nose like this make the ear like this grow a beard whatever change the gender you must have seen applications of that sort on your mobile phone as well face app or something uh, these apps they allow you to make these changes and how are these changes happening because of these generative models which are no longer just discriminating and telling you which class it is but it is able to create new images so this looks like a real image and we are now having not only generative models for images also for some other mediums do you know of other stuff that we can create synthetically in the news maybe you would have seen about deep fakes have you heard of deep fakes you can create videos of people saying something they did not actually say or doing something they did not actually do again using these methods uh, you can create fake audios even fake text you use fake text every day every time you're writing an email it gives you suggestions that suggestion is a fake generated uh, suggestion we call it a suggestion there but you can use the same technology for creating fake stuff yes yeah inshallah we'll talk at, about this in the third part so you see this is the nvidia tool very amazing it it makes use of a gan you just give it a segmented image here and you specify that okay this thing what i'm making the sketch of make it a tree and it would use its uh, prior information about what trees are and it uses a lot of computation to create new images uh, and this is amazing because and you know for instance it learns how the sky would change and how the other things would change how does it know that it knows because it has seen many images in which these things coexist even though no one has told it that when it is snowy the sun is like that the concept the algorithms they don't know about the concepts they just know about the associations okay one more thing before i finish because i want to 
this is the fundamentals of AI course. I want you to at least know the names of the techniques. Up till now, you have seen supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and you saw we could uh, have discriminative or generative models. Apart from supervised and unsupervised, you have reinforcement learning. The style of this is different because in classification, you have a one-off thing. You give it an example and you ask it to tell you about what it is. In reinforcement learning, you are doing sequential decision making. In, for example, in business, what you do today will impact your future. In life as well, whatever you do now will affect not only the next thing, but also the things that will happen after one year or two years. And the complex thing here is that we only just look at the next thing. We don't look at the long-term effects of our actions. So we want to take optimal decisions, mathematically optimal, that take into um, account the reward, not only the next reward, but also what potential there is of getting more reward in the long run. So using techniques like this, machine learning algorithms, a single algorithm has been able to defeat the, uh, humans in different games, including in the game Go. Chess is a relatively simple game. Go is a more complex game. And a computer was able to defeat the human champion in this game. The general idea here is that you interact with the environment, you perform an action, and you go to some state and you get a reward. But we want to take an action within a certain state that maximizes our reward. And that reward, is, uh, that reward, the expected reward is accumulated reward. So an intelligent person will not only do what immediately brings that person pleasure, but uh, looks into the long run and uh, calculates what is the best in the overall sense. So with this, you have um, uh, more or less um, complete picture of uh, machine learning. Obviously, there are many other things we could not cover, but you have seen supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and we also saw the difference between discriminatory models and generative models. There's a question about what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised. There is, uh, the difference is that unsupervised is unsupervised. There is no supervision. There is no labels provided. There, no correct answers are provided. So therefore, you are on your own. You, you, you can figure out whatever you can on your own. No correct answers are provided. And the other question that you can have is, what is then the difference between supervised learning and reinforcement learning? So in reinforcement learning, the style is slightly different. Reinforcement learning is basically, basically sequential decision making. Like in a robot, um, people study control theory, which is again, there is a field there really called optimal control in which you are trying to optimize what steps of action you should be taking to optimize and maximize your expected award over time. Here, um, because it's a sequential thing, the um, sometimes the reward or punishment comes at the end. You do something bad now, but you don't immediately get uh, something bad. It might happen one month afterwards or one year afterward. So reinforcement learning allows us to take this into account in a mathematical framework. OK, so Alhamdulillah, part two is done. And um, any questions related to this? The third part is actually going to be about what you mentioned, ethics and the big ideas and what are the potential pitfalls. Uh, unable to understand. Uh, what we did now, machine learning 
Mastery for Kids, something like that. You can download the model even for Python. And mostly the training thing is done using the libraries. So at the end, I will tell you of some libraries that are already there. You can just use their services, give them their data, get a model, and then use it in your code. Yes. You went through something called images, segmentation, something. Yes. There is something called augmented reality. Now. Yes. Is yes. it a byproduct of like incorporating all of these together yes. and the labeling and all of that? Yeah. So augmented reality is it something subsequent of that? Yeah. So augmented reality is another modern trend which tries to uh, enhance your experience. So for example, you may have a looking glass like Google has proposed. And when you are going, just like in the modern internet life, everything has a button you can click and information is coming up and some notification is coming. So they're trying to bring that into your real life. So some AI would definitely be necessary there, especially for the advanced services. But again, that's a different concept. It means uh, altering your the way you interact with reality. And again, there another thing is virtual reality. And combining the virtual reality with the physical reality, and you, you might have heard of the term metaverse now, which is again, making that sort of an alternative world more real. So various things, they make use of AI. Um, but those are different domains. So you see AI enables many applications and I guess those applications would also be an, uh, a beneficiary of AI. Okay, so we take a five minute break. Yes. Yes. So let's take a five minute break and uh, yeah. before we start the next session, we will cover this. Thank you. 
Jesus. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's start with the third part. <clears throat> um, okay, I think um, 
uh, let's finish this first and at the end we can ask because it may be that we might get late in finishing this so we can perhaps connect the questions okay so the third part is going to be about the big ideas and important concerns related to ai ml because even though there are so many things in ai and machine learning if you if you try to think about the big ideas they are not as many and you can try to understand the big ideas and the remaining ideas could be understood in terms of those big ideas so people have been trying to figure out the big ideas and there has been an effort within the ai community on how to teach ai now ai is being taught not only to university graduates but also to school children across the world and within the us they are working on bringing these ideas uh, into uh, their school they call it k12 education so i will be telling you some work they've done uh, in the last lecture we have in the last part of the workshop you have seen that there are various uh, types of ai machine learning models uh, within this book the master algorithm the author describes that there are various tribes in ai ml they have their own favorite methods they have their own approach to ai and they think of some of their own algorithm as the master algorithm so this book describes five main approaches what we have seen up till now is ta is taking this approach connectionist so it says that you can do something intelligent by connecting various neurons together so deep learning neural network it all falls into this domain connectionism but other than that there are other techniques as well this is another class of uh, algorithms the people here believe that analogy making kiosk or connecting various ideas together is the basis of intelligence and they have an algorithm called support vector machine which allows them to do that and there are other people who focus on evolutionary um theory and they believe that genetic programming another kind of a technique it's the basis of um, intelligence and this tribe actually focuses on probability and in your maths and statistics course you might have seen the bayes theorem which allows you to go from one kind of a condition probability to another kind of a condition probability so it allows you to see the data and figure out the sources or the causes uh, this is the inverse probability bayes theorem and bayesian techniques allow you to learn from data and to make generative models uh, a lot of uh, bayesian ideas are there and the symbolists they make use of first order logic and other kinds of logic to come up and describe knowledge and how you can reason on the basis of that so from this we see that even though i mean there is a lot of diversity and you cannot master all of that um in just one degree even so you can try to uh just know the big ideas of the field and know enough so that if necessary you can delve into more details so for that we can refer to this work that is done by the ai for k12 community in the education field they have distilled all of the ideas of ai into five aspects they say that the first thing is computers perceive they have perception i've also brought the arabic for that because this uh, they have done this effort for multiple language al idrak which means just like we have the ability to perceive things um computers have senses yet from the senses they are able to see what is what and they are they are able to have this ability of doing idrak computers perceive the world using senses this is the big idea in ai and the thing does not just start there uh, and finish there because the senses can be error prone and you would get certain readings but what you are interested in is to see the state sometimes the state is not actually observable itself 
you observe something else which is a proxy for the real thing. Uh, for instance, your camera would give you pixels, but you want to know if a certain object is there or not. For that, you have to run some more algorithms. So the first part is al-idraq or perception. The second part is representation and reasoning. And uh, in deep learning, we have seen how the network has multiple layers and the multiple layers are, uh, are learning different kinds of representations. And representation is also related to how we represent the world out there. It, it can be done using logic, but it can be done using in connectionism. You can make use of neural networks. So the Arabic for this is. Can anyone read for me and explain what that means? At termiz wal istintaj. You all understand that? Yeah, at termiz means coding or representation. Istintaj means coming at results, reasoning to come at the conclusions. The third thing is learning at the alum. Computers can learn from data, which is they can learn from their experience. This is an important part of AI. Remember at the start of the lecture, I talked about the various definitions of AI. Within that one part was learning from experience. So this is a big idea and many techniques make use of this. Uh, the fourth thing is natural interaction. So just like human beings, we interact with the environment. Uh, the computers, they have to interact with the humans and the environment. So this is called at the OK, my pronunciation is correct. OK. So. Uh, it says intelligent agents require kinds of knowledge, various kinds of knowledge. So you see natural language processing, natural language understanding. Natural language is difficult for computers because it has ambiguity. Natural images has ambiguity uh, and various other kinds of interacting with humans. It has ambiguity. Uh, human beings can say various things. Um, when a computer wants to recognize that, your uh, OK Google also has that problem. When you say something, it has to be understood in your context. Um, so uh, it, it, it is a very difficult problem. So natural language understanding, natural language interactions, uh, all of these human computer interaction stuff also applies to AI. And the fifth thing is, at the social 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 societal impact, AI can impact society in both positive and negative ways. Uh, I will talk more about that later. So this is some exp an expanded version of the same idea. So you see, your you uh, for instance a self driving car it has cameras, but then within the cameras you have the street and the people. So you need to detect where the road is, you need to segment the image, you need to recognize objects, you need to recognize pedestrians that are moving. So you have so many things uh, that um, self-driving cars have to do, which are all part of perception. Uh, the second big idea is representation learning. Um, we have to think about the various problems and how we can best represent them. In deep learning, you just use one method for all. In deep Q learning, the reinforcement learning method, you use one algorithm for everything. But although it is very versatile, it still has its limitation. You cannot have a single algorithm do everything. In particular, the critics of those methods tell you that they cannot figure out causality. And doing good science requires you to also talk about causality, which means what is causing what. With AI in its current form, you can just know these things are correlated, but you do not know what actually caused what. Uh, the third idea is learning. The fourth idea is natural interaction. The fifth idea is societal impact. And now uh, because AI can be used for making judgments, especially if it's a bank, it, it can be used for making a decision about who gets a loan or who does not get a loan. Or it can be uh, used to 
decide about who gets admit admitted into a college and who does not get admitted. So because of that, there is this risk that your AI algorithm would be unjust or it would still uh, reinforce the existing stereotypes. For instance, this is a, an, uh, a case from the US where people saw that um, there was an algorithm in charge of deciding who gets to be um, released from prison and it was biased against the blacks because if they had the same profile, the algorithm would predict that the black person would be uh, more probable uh, in doing crimes again. Even though everything is the same, even if the white person has a much uh, has a worse profile, still the, the there was a systematic discrimi uh, discrimination, and uh, this was because when you look at the previous records, uh, historically the blacks people have been victimized, and historically they have responded because of their various uh, political conditions by resorting to crime. That, that does not mean they're going to still do the same. So if you make the previous data to make a decision about the future, if there was some injustice in the past, there is a risk that you will keep on doing that in the future. So because of that, there's a lot of work now on AI ethics and on understanding how to regulate the use of AI. So since, um, okay, let me talk about some risks of AI before I will finish by talking about what you guys can do as leaders, uh, potential future leaders. So even though AI has a lot of optimism, there is, we, we need to understand that ML will not solve all our problems. In fact, much of the modern uh, machine learning is, uh, it does not have a very sound scientific basis. We, we make use of machine learning as a black box without really understanding why this decision is made in this way. And because of this, if it is making a decision on some wrong basis, we'll not be able to know that. And because of that, uh, people, they have concerns about AI. Some open questions related to machine learning and AI are noted on the slide. Because machine learning uses data to make its prediction, uh, it is likely that it will also learn the human bias. I will show you an example in a short while. The problem of interpretability means that the machine learning model works like a black box. We do not know what is inside it, how a decision is being made. Uh, there are privacy concerns because uh, to fuel modern AI, lots of data is being gathered, sometimes without the people knowing. For instance, uh, your phone has so many sensors. It, it has a mic, it can locate you. All of this data is useful for corporations and companies who want to use it for their own profit. So, and they will use this data to give you suggestions and ads that are beneficial for them. So we need to have mechanisms that put the wellness and the well-being and the uh, interest of the user and that has to come into the picture and we need to have strong rules and policies. Finally, uh, it is also a point of concern that security of machine learning can be compromised and people can attack machine learning models. With slight modifications, they could get the machine learning models to make wrong predictions. So if someone wants your machine learning model to fail, they can change their image in just the way that will make your machine learning model make the, bad, uh, the wrong decision. So in other words, we have a long way to go to build trustworthy AI and machine learning. Um, I'll give you an example just to show how, what is the problem of black box learning? So have you heard of the story of Clever Hands? Anyone? Clever Hans was a horse who could do arithmetic. So just like you people can do arithmetic, if I ask you what is three plus 
six, you will tell me it is nine. So this Hans horse, it could do arithmetic. Then the person who trained the horse when uh, in front of everyone, then the horse uh, was asked, what is three plus six or whatever question was asked. The horse would stomp its feet so many number of times just to give the answer. So it was a big uh, news that, uh, you know, this trainer has trained the horse to do mathematics. But what was actually happening was that the horse did not actually have this concept. It would just look at the trainer and the applause and the faces of the people and act. It had figured out what to do when. So people would react differently, uh, differently and look differently and the voice and other signals of the trainer would indicate to the horse what it should do. So when this experiment was performed in a new place without the crowd and all of the other things, the horse was not able to function. And how do you think this is related to machine learning? Machine learning also is learning from the environment, but it might not be learning the right thing. It might be like this horse learning other things which are not necessarily related to what the actual thing is. For instance, if you want to recognize a dog and we give the algorithm three images in which the dog is lying on a sofa. What could be a problem here? When the model learns, it would think that if you see anything on a sofa, it is a dog because that is what we have fed. And on all of these images, there is a sofa. So this is a feature which indicates this label. So you need to give it a training set that is rich enough and diverse enough so that it can discriminate between labels that must have the dog and the other images. Similarly, if uh, for instance, you want to recognize uh, something and you give uh, your machine learning model all uh, images that are all in the outdoor and the sky can be seen. So maybe the machine learning model will think that that is the case. We usually call it, uh, we, we differentiate between the signal and the noise. So we don't want to mistake the noise for the signal. If we think that the sofa is what makes all of these images, dog images, we have mistaken the noise for the signal. Here, this is the signal, there is the, this is the noise. We should be focusing on the signal. Uh, an event happened in which for object recognition, Google uh, trained on lots of data, but they did not have photos of black people. So when uh, this person, it, he uploaded an image of himself and his uh, friend, the Google algorithm said this is a gorilla, and uh, this became a big controversy. And why do you think uh, this issue came up? Because the data set was imbalanced. And you have many other cases where there is a systematic bias against black people. Because uh, what the algorithms have been trained for are the Europeans and the Americans and the white male. That's most of the data that is out there. So if that is what is going into the algorithm, your algorithm would work well for them, but not for others. So this is known as overfitting. In machine learning, this is known as overfitting. Okay, please say it again. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, like, uh, if you go back and work with the example we had about the digits, if you give it anything, it will make a prediction between the classes it has. So machine learning models are not intelligent. They are artificial intelligence. They're really dumb, but they have generalized patterns. And it depends on you. Uh, you should have the right sort of a data set. And now people are working on this that if 
you come across something that is not there in your database, you should say, I don't know. But usually the modern machine learning algorithms currently, they give an answer, even if it's a wrong answer. So you must use it in the way it was designed. And if, if we do not know about the limitations of uh, the system, we'll make errors. That's why, uh, you know what this term stands for, caveat emptor? It is a term which is used when you sell something, you also say that, you know, these are the limitations. Don't use this product in this way. If you use it in this way, it will not work. So if you use machine learning, you must know how it works so that uh, you don't use it inappropriately. This is another case in which she's a researcher uh, at MIT. She went in front of a facial recognition software and no face was detected. But when she wore this white mask, her face was detected and she used this to make her point that you recognize only white faces. And because uh, you, you see the accuracy is very bad here. The accuracy is because the machine learning model was trained basically on white faces. So this is the issue that with machine learning, you can um, systematically oppress people. Therefore, um, there is a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, like weapons of mass destruction, but because machine learning makes use of maths. And there's another book called Algorithms of Oppression. They call how these algorithms, they can reinforce oppressive uh, discriminatory behavior. For instance, she is a professor at Harvard. When she looked up her name on the internet, she saw ads that were suggesting that you might want to see if she was arrested or not. Even though she's a professor, she does not have a criminal record. Just because mostly when people come to the internet, for black people, black names, they're searching whether they have been arrested or not. Google wants to maximize its ads and its profits. It gives you the ads which Google thinks you would click on. And because of that, you also see most of the fake news we have on the internet is driven because of AI. Because they would give you these uh, clickbaits and these uh, fake news because you will click on it and their objective is to maximize the clicks. And because of that, uh, things happen which are not good for the society. Yeah, because uh, you are generalizing from the data that you have. If you do not have black faces in your data set, you will not even recognize a face here. So her face is not being recognized because the machine learning model was not trained enough for that. Just like when you when we did our example, if we have little data or unrepresentative data, your machine learning model will not learn the concept. Obviously, yeah. This is another example in which this is an automatic generating tool. So this is a Muslim researcher. He tried this tool out. Every time he wrote something which had Muslims, it was completed with a violent sentence. Two Muslim walked into a church and into a mosque. One found, uh, you, you look more like a terrorist than I do. So things of this sort come in because these models have been trained on news sources and texts that are coming from the mainstream community, which is biased against the Muslims. So if you take that data, you train a machine learning model, it will just perpetuate that. So that's a problem. You need to actually work on making your data set more uh, balanced and just. You need to actively think about who is going to use it and ensure that the accuracy good is good for all of the users. Okay, now coming to the last part, AI and leadership. After seeing what AI can do for us, uh, you're mashallah working in different fields. 
you, you have the potential of going on to work as inventors, makers and builders, policy makers, problem solvers, uh, and you can make a difference to the community. So we need to look at technology critically. This is uh, an editor of Wild Magazine, a tech, uh, technical magazine. He says that every new technology will bite back. The more powerful its gifts, the more powerful it can be abused. So for instance, we make use of the internet. It's a wonderful tool. We make use of social media. It's a wonderful tool. AI is a wonderful tool. However, the same technologies, one can argue they, even though it can connect us, but it is disconnecting it us more. We have a person in front of us, yet we do not talk. We instead focus on superficial communications on the phone. Um, it makes it difficult for us to make sense of the world because now we have too much information and much of it is fake news. Uh, it impacts politics and elections. Uh, do you know of the Cambridge Analytica case? Uh, you can search for it. Cambridge Analytica is a company in UK which was used by Trump. And Trump, because of that, knew about various voters and they would send the people uh, carefully crafted messages so that they can make convince them to vote for Trump. Uh, this became a scandal because Cambridge Analytica used the data from Facebook um, in a way that was uh, at that time not legal and they got all of that data and they created models that could predict the right thing to say to them so that they could change. So because of that, there is a concern that our politics and elections are being impacted. Uh, I've mentioned how this uh, these algorithms can be racist. Uh, they can perform well for uh, certain races, less for other races. When people did research on um, cloud machine learning algorithms and they gave them images they saw, the best accuracy is for white males and the worst accuracy is for black females because uh, that is the class that is re least represented in their data. And because of that, there is a big difference. So we don't want our algorithm to only work for some people and not for others, because it can then affect their lives and careers. OK, so you know of this story of King Midas? This is a myth about a king who wanted everything he would touch would turn into gold. So machine learning is like that. You tell it something, it would give you exactly that. It will not give you anything less or more. If you ask it to give you best accuracy, it will give you best accuracy even if that means it is very poor for some people. If you want to have a fair system, it will give you a fair system in the way that you define it, but it might not give you the best accuracy. So we need to make these judgment calls and understand that machine learning, like uh, it was said before, they are like giant robots, uh, giant morons. You just say whatever you say, it will only do that. For instance, uh, this uh, uh, reinforcement learning was used to play this game. And this game, the reinforcement learning algorithm found a cheat code because it was trying to increase the score. So it, it found a cheat code that could just uh, not play the game in, in which it was intended, but still increase the reward. So if you just, even in a society, if you just say to a person, you have to do this, that person will do anything that gets there, even if the other good things are not done. If a student only wants to have the right GPA, I mean, he or she can just cheat or do other things. But the purpose is you have a good GPA, but while also looking into the other values that we have. So uh, a big concern these days is that how machine learning can be human values aware and compatible. Whatever our human values are, how can machine learning automatically infer and do its job while not contradicting any human values? Uh, have you guys seen this documentary, The Social Dilemma? If you see this, uh, many of these concerns are 
noted there in more detail. So um, an important point this book makes is that there are ethical choices in every single algorithm we build. So even though you're going to work as technical engineers, you might think we uh, are not responsible for the things that we are creating, but every time you make an algorithm, you're making many judgment calls. You're deciding various things. What are you going to optimize for? What technique you are going to use? What are the pros and cons? What are the trade-offs? Who's going to benefit from this? Who's going to be impacted? So you need to think about all of these things. And this is uh, in the world of data science. This is perhaps uh, a throwback to older times where we had this concept of wisdom. So data and information is not the same as wisdom. Um, wisdom is much more important. So wisdom will guide you on what to do. And so you need to things look at things more holistically. And also, uh, interestingly, as technology is becoming more and more dominant, the questions of values are also gaining more prominence. So uh, you should not equate can build it with should build it. Uh, you need to think about what are going to be the impact of things, um, not only for your own self or your own corporation or your own country, but also for the common good of humanity. Interestingly, AI ethics is now a big topic. Many people are working on it. We are working on it also. And um, these are some of the resources that you can use to learn about machine learning, AI, deep learning. These are three books uh, I, I think are very good. Uh, you have various open online courses, Udacity, Coursera, edX. They, I mean, this is the topic you can find um, the most resources on. On the internet, on everything, you will have a course. And then there are various tools that are available. TensorFlow is a tool that has made deep learning easy. It's a library everyone can use. PyTorch is a library uh, initially developed by Facebook uh, AI. There is fast.ai as well. There are cloud services by Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Uh, you can do machine learning online using Colab. Uh, you can use your phones or your microcontrollers or Arduinos for also learning machine learning. So with this, I come to the end of the lecture. Um, I would like to highlight that I used lots of resources from various places. Some of them are cited here, but many other resources were used. So due credit to all of them. So I'll finish here. And if you have questions, I can take your questions from this part and the last part. Yes. Okay. Do you think it'll be a good thing where we can depend? Yeah. So we have to decide as a community if we want to get there, first of all, uh, because people make the argument that we should not leave everything to the AI or the robot because. Um, you know, we are responsible. We are ethical beings. Uh, we call it we are mukallif, moral responsibility. The robots, the AI, they don't have moral responsibility. It is upon us to decide. So um, probably uh, one approach that we have now, which is coming up, is to have hybrid partnership of AI and human beings. In, in which uh, the algorithms are used for augmenting human capabilities, making things easier for us. Yet at the same time, it is human values and humans who would be occupying center stage. We want to create that future. So, but still people, they have various uh, opinions. But um, I will just tell you that there are now many centers which are now uh, working on, for example, human compatible AI, human beneficial AI, human centered AI, which seems to highlight that they have recognized that we want to put humans at the center of our thinking rather than just the machines. Um, 
unsupervised earlier, you had comparisons and then analysis or something like that. But they're comparing it to something that you give them. Yes. So isn't that in a in a way still supervised because you're the one who gives them the answer to compare? For to whom? Them? For which technique? Unsupervised? Yeah, but then yeah, well, unsupervised. Isn't it in a way actually supervised? Because you do yeah. give them an answer to compare to. No, for unsupervised, we will just give it the data. We do not give any answers or the associated labels. We do not give it. It's just that we ask it to organize it, maybe reduce the dimensionality. It might be a very large data set. We ask it to be reorganized in some way. We do not provide any answers. The difference between supervised and unsupervised is that for supervised, for every data point, you give an associated label. You don't do that for unsupervised. But then how would they provide later the right answer? Yeah, there are no right answers in unsupervised. There are only um, bad representations and better representations. So depending on what sort of uh, improvement you require, there are various unsupervised methods. For, in uh, for instance, it may be that you have a data set that has lots of variables, but you want to know which variable is most important. So that sort of a thing unsupervised learning can do. Uh, it's called principal component analysis. This is one way which allows you to describe of the various things that are um, contributing what, what variables are the most important. Such thing we can do with unsupervised. Yes, uh, if there is a question on Teams, you, you may please ask it. Yeah, thank you very much for your very informative session. So I have two questions. So one question is like um, you talk about the reinforcement learning. So what I get is like it is like the learning, um, like creating a model that takes input from from the surroundings or the environment. Is it correct like this? Uh, yes, you do interact with the environment. Uh, but the primary difference uh, is that sequential decision making uh, is characterizing your way of interacting. Um, so in um, real life, there are many things that are sequential in nature. You take a decision, you get a reward. Then you take another decision, you get another feedback and you keep on doing this again and again. So for these problems, uh, one um, complexity is that when you do an action, the reward is not always going to be the same. So you see this many times in real life. You do something, you might get lucky or you might not get lucky. So the return or the reward is probabilistic. So one way of doing this is using Markov decision process, which is a way of de doing uh, decisions in an uncertain environment in which the uh, reward of an action is probabilistic. And reinforcement learning is a way that sorts of uses machine learning within this setting. So uh, it means that um, this type of learning is suitable like when we have like something related to the real time scenario. Yeah, maybe? like playing a game. So you, yeah. saw, you saw that it was uh, used in uh, for uh, playing AlphaGo and for playing uh, Pong or other games. So in a game, uh, you take an action and then the other entity or the environment takes an action and then you take another action and you keep on doing this. This is an example of sequential decision making. And how do you how do you comment like uh, generative learning? So uh, I didn't heard about this before. So is it uh, advanced uh, some technique or something that that you have given example that, for example, if we give like thousand images to an algorithm, so it creates a new phase. So uh, how do you comment on this generative, like to explore this? People are working on them on yes. this type of algorithms. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, generative techniques in general have been in use uh, for a long time. People have been working on it. Uh, the example I gave was of GAN, which is generative adversarial network, which was uh, a work done by, you know, you see the book on the right side. One of the author is Ian Goodfellow. So he did, he created this generative adversarial network and now it is used in various places. And uh, these gener generative adversarial networks, they are actually a combination of two fields. 
uh, generative uh, models and also game theory. Game theory is another science. When you combine them, uh, it it opened up a new possibility and now it's used various places. Now there are tools available which anyone can use. So if you want to study more, you can look at GANs. OK, so my last question is like, can we combine uh, like supervised and unsupervised learning to make a new model? Is there, is there is a possibility or it's like a concept is correct like this? Yes, uh, in fact, there is something known as semi supervised learning and there are various variations as well. So there are, I mean, uh, if you go into the depth of things, there there's a lot of work. So if you want to do on uh, something in between supervised and unsupervised, there are options available as well. You can look at semi-supervised. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have another question here from Fatima. Fatima Zakaria. You can go ahead and ask, please. OK, so I think there is some other question as well. If you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, sorry, can you please share the, the slides of the session? Yes, inshallah, I can. OK, thank you very much. I'll share it to the organizer and they will forward it. OK, we have another question here from Ahmed. Is it always beneficial to provide many visual examples for the AI system? So he's talking about, let's say, an elephant drawing needs to be recognized. Uh, he thinks that we cannot uh, limit how an elephant is going to be drawn, even yes. if the individual photos uh, for all parts of the elephant are present. So it may not match the drawing. Yeah, so that's the complexity. Uh, it's, it's correct that uh, things uh, often come in a lot of uh, variety. So if you want your system to work in the real world, it is uh, often very helpful to collect as much data as you can. Uh, if you have a lot of data, uh, then it should be able to generalize. And this depends on your task. For instance, we wanted to show Joha and digit recognition. It was a fun example. And even if we made an error, it was OK. But if it is going to be used in some critical application, you must not only draw, you must also augment it in various ways. You may flip it, you may change the background, you may try all kinds of variations which will mimic how this character may be seen in the real world. So um, the trick that we have is that we make use of lots of data and then there are methods of data augmentation. You have data, you automatically create variations of that. So. Uh, the solution is to have lots of data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, the people who work in the field, they recognize this as one of the uh, shortcomings of modern AI. Uh, usually even within, um, I think there was, sorry. Yeah, so in this regard, there are people who are working on this, on emotional AI, uh, recognizing your facial expressions, because if you want to talk to real people, you need to recognize what mood they are in. So, uh, and um, people have some work in this regard. For instance, if it's a customer service company, they want to recognize how angry a person is. If that person is talking in an angry mode, they have certain tools available. And mostly what they do is they collect data on angry customers. And from that, they are able to classify but um, it's a field people are working on, but it's not as advanced as it should be. Um, one field which works on it is known as effective AI, A-double-F-E-C-T, 
IVE. Affective means related to emotions. And there are a few researchers wor working on it. Over time, the importance of this will increase. Yeah. Yes. Um, it is a, an orthogonal way of thinking about it. It can work in both ways, I guess. Mostly it's going to be supervised, uh, but it is a different axis. Right? So you think of it as something different, um, but I think it can work in both uh, flavors, both in supervised and unsupervised. Machine learning or? It's part of machine learning, yes. Yes, any other questions? OK, so if there are no more questions, then thank you very much for attending, and I wish you the very best for the remainder of the course. Thank you.